Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for uh, bracing the cold, wet snow and cleaning off your cars and making it to church this morning. Um, the first thing I want to do is we have a birthday, and we're going to sing to Miss Karen. Happy, Happy birthday to you. All right. Our first song is There Is None Like You, and really there is none like him. He moves mountains. He parts waters. He restores your soul. And let's just stand and praise his holy name this morning. Romans 11, verse 33 to 36. All the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable is judgment and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsel? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen.
your seat, please. Good morning, church. It is a glorious day, whether you like the snow or not. <laughs> I do. God is good. And all the time. Father God, we pause right now at this part of the service where we call upon you. We recognize you for the God of creation. The good, good Father, for you now, I ask that your Holy Spirit would have free reign, that as we were worshiping and singing and praising you, feeling the power of your presence is an amazing thing. And us, your people, we, we choose to do that today. We want to commune, we want to engage with you, and we're going to do that now through your word, through your story, your love letter to us. Father, I pray that we would have wisdom and discernment that we could see and know and, and, and gain these truths and, and, and make this application in this thing we call life. And I just pray for power of your Holy Spirit in our life to enable us to hear and to see your, you, you, through these words today, the story of Joseph. And so, Lord, bless our time, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're into week three of the story. We're into the story of Joseph, right? He goes from, from slavery into becoming the deputy pharaoh of the land in an amazing process. How many of you are enjoying your time reading through the story, right? It, it is just a great way to engage God and to, to see his word as one seamless transition of his story of redemption to bring us back to him. We learned that in week one in creation, right? That God desires for us to be with him together again and in the garden one day, and that will be true, and that will happen. And we're seeing how it unfolds, and today um, we're, we're still in Genesis, now in the story of Joseph. When we summarize this and we take it down to one verse, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. And if you're there, and, and, and what I want you to do, and I'm trying to, to get you to be in your Bible and, and to do that more. And so I'm going to be doing less and less scripture from the screen, some particulars. But the meat of it, I want to get you in there. I want you flipping back and forth. Not necessarily through the, the story, but your Bible. And to, to follow along uh, through that. And so the summary for this, and, and, and I think this does a great job, Genesis 50 and 20, and the word of the Lord says this, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And that's kind of the story of Joseph in a nutshell. One of the central themes of the Old Testament is that God keeps his covenant. God keeps his promises to his people and whether extending his hand a blessing or the rod of judgment at every point God works to fulfill his covenant promise to Abraham and he promised to make a great nation of Abraham's descendants giving them the promised land and then through them to bless all nations on earth in the life of Joseph one of Abraham's grandsons we see the great lengths to which God will go to preserve his chosen people and to bring about his promise to fulfillment. The story of Joseph, Joseph is about more than just one person, though. It's a story of an entire nation. The, the future of Israel is at stake here. 
And as Joseph lived through year after year, enduring slavery, imprisonment, and then eventually a rise to a position of power and authority and blessing, it may have been a very hard time to discern God's purpose in the midst of it all. However, through it all, we see that God was working to fulfill these promises that he made to Joseph uh, in his prophetic dream that he would one day be the safeguard of Israel. Although the growing family of Abraham's descendants never could have known this in advance, a regional famine is on its way. Little did the brothers realize that by selling his brother into slavery that God would turn this act of jealousy and hatred into the way of salvation for his people. In this chapter, we see that God's plans cannot be stopped by sinful humans. And at the end of this, rebellious and selfish actions of God's enemies are part of really God's mysterious will at work for redemption and for salvation of his people. They may intend their actions for evil purposes, but God's good purpose will ultimately triumph in it all. So let's take a look at what is the upper story. This is what God's plan is. Then we're going to talk about our story, how our story interacts and aligns with his story. But first, the upper story. The nation of Israel is growing, just as God promised it would be. But there's a devastating famine ahead, and it, and it threatens to wipe out an entire nation. If Israel is gone, then God cannot provide a way for it to come back to him through the offspring of Israel. So he intervenes in a very unique way. God uses the dysfunction, the disobedience, the sibling rivalry that comes about. He uses the jealousy of Joseph's brothers, all of that, to save Israel from extinction. When Joseph tells his brothers of the two dreams in which all the brothers will bow down to him, and then what do they do? They sell him into slavery, which eventually takes him to Egypt. God orchestrated the affairs of Joseph in such a way that it, he becomes second in command of all of Egypt, where under his leadership and through God's divine insight, he's preparing for a famine. 22 years later, Joseph's dreams come true. His brothers leave Canaan. They come to Egypt in search of food. When they arrive in Egypt, they bow down to their younger brother. It is through this dramatic event that Israel is saved, and the story continues. So let's look at the, lower, the lower story, how we perceive this and how we interact with it. Joseph connected with God's upper story plan, and he realized how God was using him as a character in his story. This enabled Joseph to be able to forgive his brothers. What a tough act that must have been. He saw that what they meant for evil, that in the lower story, God used it for good in the upper story. And if we love God, and if we align ourselves to his upper story, to his plan, he promises to use us for all senses of, of our lives for good. This gives us the power to forgive others who hurt us. The hope to rise above the current circumstance, knowing that it's not the end of the story. And so in this story of Joseph, the first thing that we notice is this. And for your note takers, this is where we're going to dive into this. The first thing we notice is that there's family troubles. There are definitely some troubles within the family. Um, this comes out of Genesis 37. And if you want to get there eventually, we're going to be reading from, from there. and We'll be flipping along as we go. But we're introduced to Joseph when he was around 17 years of age. And for our teenage boys, they, they get that. They understand what it's like to be that. He is the son of Jacob. Jacob, we learned, was renamed Israel, right, as going to be the forefather of God's new nation. He is the grandson of Isaac the great-grandson of Abraham. These are names that we've uh, developed over the last few weeks and we've talked about. So we see the promise to Abraham to make him a great nation and to have the multitude of people is coming true. Joseph became instrumental in God's upper story, and he did this in two ways, two significant ways. First, through the saving of the people of this growing nation from a terrible famine 
that threatened to extinguish him before they really were going to get underway. And secondly, revealing God's ability to transform, to transform the worst betrayals into amazing evidence of God's goodness. And so Joseph was very instrumental in the upper story through the saving and the transformation. Sounds really familiar, doesn't it? To be saved and to be transformed. We're going to talk later about some parallels between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph's family certainly didn't function like a divine dynasty out of which God was building a nation. It just didn't seem like it. You would not predict that from in the midst of it. They could barely get along with each other. And we're not talking about just normal rivalry that happens among brothers. Joseph's brothers literally left him to die. Right? They, they put him into a pit. It says a cistern or a pit. This would have been into the ground. They left him there to die. There, there's no doubt about it. They're going to teach him a lesson. How dare you come to me and tell me that we will bow down to you. You're just a runny-nosed little kid. And that was the dysfunction of the family. You see, the 12 brothers, Joseph was dad's favorite. He even sported this special ornate robe, right? The coat that he gave him. And he gave him, and it left his brothers feeling a little bit resentful. They didn't like it. They, they, they didn't care for it much. We find this in, in chapter 37, in verse 4. 37, 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Most of us are going to sit back and say, who would blame them? Right? To make matters worse, worse Joseph had some dreams and did he sensed were from God. Each of these dreams ended with his brothers all bowing down to him. Now, in his oblivious innocence, young Joe went and shared these dreams with his brothers, who in turn soon tried to change them into his worst nightmare. One day, Jacob sends Joseph out to see how his brothers are doing out in the field. They seize the opportunity to rough him up a little bit and then throw him into the pit. Over lunch, they make a decision to sell the younger brother to a band of gypsies on their way to Egypt. By doing this, they technically would not be guilty of murder. But little brother would be as good as dead. To deceive their father and to cover up this betrayal of the little brother, they dipped Joseph's special robe into some animal blood on the way home and to tell the father that his favorite son had been mauled by a ferocious animal. Needless to say, Jacob, the father, was devastated. He was inconsolable over losing his son. Now talk about family troubles, right? We think we've got it bad. Um, my older brothers want to do a lot of things to me, but not sell me into slavery or leave me for dead. I was telling the, the youngsters in Sunday school that he... My next oldest brother, Jim, which most of you have met, uh, at one point tried to throw me through my parents' bedroom window. And that's about as close as we ever got to that. Uh, I did something that he didn't care for. And, uh, and he still has not forgotten me. So, so Jim, if you're watching this morning, uh, I'm still not sorry. And uh, no, Just kidding. So dysfunction, family troubles, we all have them. And, and we probably all have stories that we can share. So that moves us on. The first thing we see is the family troubles, and that plays an important part. And now it moves into going into Egypt. We find Joseph going into Egypt. Once in Egypt, the gypsy traders, though, they're quick to sell him off into slavery. And he ends up in the house of Potiphar. He's the captain of the guard, a military man, and uh, to the mighty pharaoh. And having suffered betrayal and abuse at the hands of his brothers, Joseph then experiences a surprising development. Immediately after the Bible reports on Joseph's new status as a slave, comes this sentence. If you're, if you're there, chapter 39, verse 2, the beginning of verse 2, 39, 2. This comes right away. He sold off as a slave, and then this appears in the scriptures says this, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. 
So he's sold off into slavery. God recognizes this and says, hey, in my upper story and in this plan, I need to move him to a position of authority of his favor. Even though God allowed his brothers to abuse him, God is now prospering him, all with God's help. And Joseph quickly rises to a status, is put in charge of Potiphar's entire house. This would be like the, the, the president of the United States, his chief of staff, putting a janitor in charge of the West Wing. I mean, that's, that, that would equate something of that nature. Joseph is given the responsibility over everything that Potiphar owns. And with Joseph in charge, the Egyptians' estate grows and prospers. In a way, Joseph is a part of the family, living in Potiphar's estate, a fact that is not unnoticed by Potiphar's wife. Just when everything seems to be back on track, it's time for another bomb, or should I say a bombshell. And this pops up in the story. Now, Scripture tells us that Joseph was a well-built and handsome man to which the teenage boys, when we talked about this, they were quick to identify themselves <laughs> as Joseph, right? Because part of it was asked, who do you relate to in the story and why? I'm not going to tell you which one jumped out, but one of them said, that's me, right? He's raising his hand. <laughs> that's me. And it's because I'm well-built and handsome. And uh, anyhow. So you don't have to, to be a rocket scientist to figure out what's going to happen next. While Potiphar's away at work one day, Mrs. Potiphar comes into Joseph, doesn't pretend to be subtle about her intentions, and says, hey, come to bed with me. She's very forthright in that. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been tempted to do something you knew was wrong, but you thought you'd never get caught? There's no way I can get caught at this. Here we have our leading man, Joseph, young and handsome, placed in an unfavorable situation because of the cruelty of others and with an opportunity to enjoy himself. No one could have blamed him for giving in since a slave who refuses to obey the orders would be severely punished. From a human perspective, from the lower story perspective, Joseph could have easily been on his way to the bedroom, but Joseph chose to trust in God. And he tells her this in verse 9 of chapter 39. He says, My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph may have not fully known God's upper story or, or his role in it, yet he chooses to align himself with God rather than align himself with Potiphar's wife. Is he rewarded for his obedience? I'm afraid not. Potiphar's wife continues to try to get Joseph to go to bed. And he continues to refuse until she cannot take rejection anymore. And as a payback, payback she tells Potiphar that Joseph tried to come on to her. He's sent to prison for a crime he didn't commit. The young man finds himself worse off than when he started. I did some research and, and looked back to what it would like been like to be in prison in this time. Archaeologists and historians report that Egyptian prisons during this era would be one of two things. It would either be a large pit that's dug into the ground or a fortress-like facility where prisoners awaited their punishment, usually, usually torture and then death. And so this is what was awaiting Joseph. And for what? He was honoring God by refusing to sleep with his master's wife. When you think about it, from our lower story perspective, Joseph appeared to be abandoned by God. Where was the Lord whom Joseph refused to sin against? Did he change his mind about Joseph? Not at all. Not on your life. Divine words from the upper story whisper this. Chapter 39, now in verse 21. 39, 21. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Does that sound familiar? The Lord was with him. 
Once again, God joined Joseph in his suffering. These experiences are giving Joseph training, and the training is to trust God as he prepared him to face this grand opportunity that was still to come. God didn't spare Joseph from the difficulty, or even from betrayal. He didn't spare him that. Why? Because mankind's original choice in the garden, we will always have to face adversity and hardship. But even in our deepest need, God is with us. In the deepest moments of our life, in the hardest situations, in the greatest adversity and hardship that you can imagine that you've been through, God is with us. We might wonder where and why sometimes and how's this going to happen, but we need to look to God for his upper story. We understand that God is with Joseph and now that he, he's back in prison. God would use his gifting as he had to give him, to free him from his bondage. And so now moving through the story of Joseph, this moves us to true dreams. We're going to move on to, to chapter 41 ultimately. So Joseph's life, you kind of equate it to a yo-yo or even to a seesaw. How many wrote teeter-totters or seesaws, right? Up and down, up and down, up and down. That's Joseph's life. The story tells us that he'd been in prison for two years when he was summoned by Pharaoh, and he came to interpret the leader's reoccurring dream. Using his prophetic interpretive gift, Joseph explains to the Pharaoh that the land was about to experience seven years of a bumper crop, but that would be followed by seven years of a drought. And so if they were going to, to be able to survive this famine, they must prepare out of the surplus up front to be ready for what was to come. Pharaoh believes him and puts him into second command of all of Egypt. He's dressed into fine linens. He's decked out with some royal jewelry. Joseph could hardly have imagined what his new role would be when he was curled up at the bottom of that well, listening to his brothers decide to sell him. And then he's falsely accused and imprisoned. He couldn't have believed that he would rise to power to be second in command to only the king. But at each step of his journey, when it appeared that God had abandoned him, what did he do? He chose to trust God. So in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the adversity, he made a choice, because we have choices, don't we? God gives us freedom of will and free to choose. And he chose to trust God to believe that God knew what he was doing. We ever doubted God? God, what in the world are you up to? Because this makes no sense to me. Most of the time we choose to do our own thing our own way because that makes earthly sense. But from Joseph's lower story perspective, his life was his unpredictable series of a roller coaster event which had, he thought he had very little control over. But in the upper story, God had the perfect plan and was in complete control. And so this leads to the fulfillment of God's plan or to the dream being fulfilled. The dream is fulfilled. Under Joseph's leadership, the Egyptians, they store tons of food over the next seven years. And so when the famine strikes, just as God had predicted through Joseph, people from other countries start pouring into Egypt. They come to beg and to barter for food. Back in Canaan, Jacob sends his sons, all except Benjamin, the very youngest, and he sends them to buy grain. Now, oblivious to the fact that their beloved Joseph, whom Joseph believed to be dead, he thought he was dead, but he was in charge of the food distribution in Egypt. And so when the brothers arrive in Egypt, what do they do? They they bow down before the second in command of the whole land. They bow down to their little punk brother. Although they don't recognize him, and, and after several emotional encounters, Joseph reveals his identities to his brothers. He assures them, I'm not angry with you. Make plans 
And he starts to make plans to settle them in Egypt, to take care of them. Out of his position of power, he gives them the fertile lands of Goshen. We're told that when his dad was getting close to Egypt, Joseph went out on a chariot to meet him. And in, in chapter 46 and in verse 29, it says this. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and he wept for a long time. Wouldn't you love to have been at that reunion? How did Joseph do that? How did he have such an amazing attitude through it all? How did he forgive his brothers? That would be a tough one. I, I say the answer is rather clear. It had to be that somewhere in his journey, Joseph caught a glimpse. He, he caught a glimpse of God's upper story plan and what his role would be in it. How else would he persevere through it? He trusted God because he saw him seeing him through. He could testify to what he had done for him in his past and knew that it would be in the future. Listen to what he says to his brothers. In Genesis 45, I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. This is Joseph talking to his brothers after they come to him and bow before him. Genesis 45, beginning in verse 4. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there's been a famine in the land and for the next five years there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to persevere for you a remnant on earth to save your lives and, and by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. There's some strong words there. It wasn't you that sent me here. It wasn't you that put me in the pit and left me to die or, or to be sold off as a slave or to be imprisoned. No, God sent me here to save you. Later on, he would say, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. When we capture or align ourselves to God's upper story, it enables us to process all the junk that we might experience in our lower story. And so that's what we need to be seeking, is us aligning with God's upper story. How do our lives align with his and when we catch a glimpse of God's story of his plan and re that is redemption for mankind when we see that then we need to do what it takes for us to align our stories together it's then that we can experience and get through the junk of this life to one day be reunited with him in the next Joseph lived to be 110 years old Yes, he went through a period of 22 tough years from the age of 17 on. But we mustn't forget that he ended up with 71 really great years. How rich it must have been to know that he was used by God. He was used by God to save the nation of Israel, to move the upper story plan forward towards its completion. God used him because... He trusted God. Even from a young boy, he knew that God had a plan and a purpose for him. His chapter rings true for us today. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Romans 8 and 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God works for the good. Now, now we like to quote this, that when something bad's happening, right? We, you know, 
God's going to use that for good. You know there's a disclaimer at the end of that, though? Not for everybody. It's not a blanket statement that God is going to use your harm for good. If you love him and if you're living out his purpose, then he's going to take what is bad, he's going to take the adversity, the hurt and the pain, and he's going to use it for good to further his cause, the upper story. And so are you in alignment with his upper plan? Do you have Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior in your life? Because that, that's the disclaimer here. God can use what others mean for evil and harm in your life for good. But we need to be seeking God in our life. His will, his plan in our own personal life and corporately within the life of the church as we seek to challenge, influence, and impact this southern Hamilton County region for Jesus Christ. No matter how painful some moments might seem, our story is never over. If you love God, and if you align your life to his upper story purposes, everything in your life, the ups and downs, the mountaintops and the valleys, the heights and the lows, the raises and the rejections, the good and the bad will all work together to accomplish the good. But you need to be patient. You need to trust God. You need to let him mold you in these difficult seasons to equip you for the assignment that he has for you to come. That's where we have the hard time because we don't always know what's coming next. We can't see beyond our current situation and the issues and the problems that's causing us. We have a hard time looking beyond and allowing God to see us through. Joseph had finally emerged from the dark days of slavery. He emerged from the imprisonment Ironically, his own dreams were fulfilled by helping others interpret their dreams. For Joseph's brothers, coming face to face with their brother was an earth-shaking encounter. He was no longer the little brother that they could push around, but a powerful ruler who could have had him thrown out of the place, who could have done him in. He could have given them into slavery like they had done to him, which would have been my inclination was to, they're going to do that to me, I'm going to do that to you. I'll show you. But Joseph had not harbored a desire for vengeance. Despite their worries, his brothers really had nothing to fear. The same perspective that has sustained Joseph through the most difficult trials now guided him in his response to them. Joseph's belief that God was in charge freed him to forgive his brothers. So if you're having a hard time forgiving, and, and some of us do, when somebody hurts us and does something to us, you need to realize who's really in charge. And it's God, not us. But we want to be in charge. But he was freed up to forgive his brothers. And that was the key to understanding God's greater plan. See, he would have been held in bondage if he had not forgiven his brothers. Then he would have been held captive in his own pain and couldn't see beyond it to know what God had for him. And to the plan to create the family out of Abraham would have been thwarted. It would have stopped. But, but Joseph chose to believe and to forgive. And so what are your, what are your takeaways from all of this? Making a note. I love it when the Holy Spirit does that. So what are your takeaways from all of this? God's upper story weaves a tale of, I would say, relentless pursuit. Because God's going to pursue us all the days of our life, whether we, we turn to him and, and surrender to him or not. He doesn't just desire to turn to whatever was intended for evil to good in your life, although he will do that. What God really desires is a few things. First and foremost, you need to know and understand that he wants you. 
God wants a personal relationship with you. That should warm your heart. That, that he wants to be with you. Me, little old me. You hear me say this all the time. Who is he that he's mindful of even me? I sometimes think of myself as one of the most insignificant in all of life. And he wants me. He wants to have a, a fellowship with me. That means something special. Not just to say he has a relationship and he can mark that and check that off in his book, but he wants to have fellowship, a personal relationship, a time of communing together, communication, to help us grow and to learn and to love us and for us to love him. God wants that for you. It is then that we can learn to trust him, that we can see his upper story plan, and that we can align our lower story with his. Joseph refused to allow famine to destroy the nation. God refused to allow that to happen. And so we have no idea what the betrayals and the injustices are that await us in our own life. It may happen today, it might happen tomorrow, later this week, or sometime this month or within the year. All we know for sure is that in our lifetimes, there may be occasions to wonder, God, did you forget me? There will be times that we will think that. Life is filled with disappointment. And, and when it hits, we must rise above it. We must uh, allow the strength of God and his goodness. We need to listen to him whisper that he loves us. That he's not abandoned us. No matter what. And if we look beyond what seems to be to define our lower story and to trust God, to trust him that he's writing something much bigger than what our current circumstance is, then we can trust that the ending will be much more than living happily ever after because that's what we look for. We're always told of the, the fairy tale ending and that's what we want, right? In the American dream, to live happily ever after. God wants more than to live happily ever after. God wants it to feel like we're coming home. To be with him. To one day be reunited as it was in the garden. And to be in that perfect relationship with him. That's what he wants. I pray that is for you. That you can take this into your heart of hearts and... And, and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he wants that personal relationship. And that can only happen through Jesus Christ. Whom we see and, and we know that these have all been relating to and, and looking forward to that. I have a slide here I want to share with you briefly. Can you read that? It's a little dark, isn't it? Now it's better back here than it is up there. You don't necessarily have to write this down. I could print this if you want it. There are so many parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. I've only listed five here. There's over 100 parallels between the life of Joseph and Jesus. Both of them made claims about who they were and people hated them and there's scriptural references to both of them. Joseph, of course, to his brothers. <laughs> and they didn't just hate him, they did him in. And we know that Jesus died. They suffered because others hated him. And that's I just shared that and what had happened in their life. Both of them loved and offered forgiveness to others. Joseph continued to choose God's upper story plan to love his brothers and to forgive them. Jesus forgave those who even crucified him. They both took care of others' needs. Joseph was able to do so physically and to provide for them, Jesus doing the spiritual care. They both suffered evil that God used for good. And on and on and on the list goes. God's story of redemption, his plan, 
is for us to align our lower story plan with his upper story. For us to love him, to conditionally, unconditionally um, believe and to trust in him. And then we can start to claim the Romans 8.28 In our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the story of Joseph, it, it, it's screaming loud and clear from the scriptures. We have a story here of, of a, a young man, a boy, that chose to trust in you and to give his life and to, to find what, what your great plan was. And he knew that it was you speaking in his life. And so, Father, I pray right now that as we contemplate what this means to us and how that looks in our life, I pray that we can, too, put that same kind of trust into you. That we can look beyond ourselves, We can look beyond our situation and circumstance and to place our trust wholeheartedly into you. That one day we knowing the fruits of, of our labor and, and the situations we're in, that we can see the blessings that come beyond. Father, thank you for loving us enough to make that happen. May each of us know that personal relationship with Jesus, and if we don't, that we seek that out, that we give our heart to Christ. Father, we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask for our ushers to come forward at this time. We will take our tithes and our offerings. While that is happening, there is a... This is a new song that we are going to be putting into the mix, and you will have the opportunity to sing along. Let me... Uh, you bring. This wasn't planned to do the week of Joseph, but uh, <laughs> but it's sort of appropriate if you look at the if you look at the words in the song. You know, Annie does a real good job of picking out lyrics that have some meaning, and this is a song of singing praise when you don't really feel like singing praise. Thank you. 
What a powerful, powerful song that is. Thank you for listening to God and being selective to the music that we have. And Pastor Ryan, you were right. Not a planned, uh, well, God planned, uh, but not planned by man. That's the upper story thing. And that's the upper story thing, right? Aligning with our God's lower story. So thank you guys. God bless you for that and for you as well. Let me share you a couple things as we head out today and, and as things are going to be going on. First, I want to mention, and up here on the table, there's two sheets here. This is the new directory, and um, I think we've got it pretty much together, so I want you to check the info, you know, the address, the phone number, make sure that's all correct on one of the two or the other. If it's not correct, scratch it out, write in there what is correct, and hopefully by next week we can get out a new directory for our folks, and we've had a lot of new folks come in and things that have changed, so we'd like to get that into your hands. Uh, so make sure you check that before you go. Uh, fellowship dinner will help it happen next Sunday. That's the last Sunday of the month. And so dish to pass and uh, bring that with you and bring your appetite. Sa Saturday, February 1st will be a, our uh, sign language class. It's going to happen at 1 p.m. Uh, on Saturday, February 1st. Ivani will be teaching that and, and helping us to better communicate with them, but not just to them, those the others that are hearing impaired. There's a, a large a group of folks, uh, even in our community, that are uh, in need of that type of uh, e ministry, and we can offer that and be able to to help them. So come and be a part of that as well. I think that's pretty much everything. I see a hand. Yes, the the um, the thank you that happens on the twenty Saturday Sunday, Sunday five p.m. See, I got it. It's up here. So Sunday the 26th, that's next Sunday, at 5 p.m. is a thank you dinner for those that helped during the flooding uh, here in town. And so what's going to happen is the, the folks that gave themselves and their time and their energies, they're going to be recognized and honored during that time. Come and enjoy. For those that are coming to be in support of them, bring some type of a dish to share with the, with the folks in the community, and that will happen at 5 p.m. Community Hall. And uh, we'd love for you to be there and be supportive. We were the recipients of help from the community, so it would be great for us to, to be able to, to make a good showing there and, and to encourage them for helping uh, all of us. So, yes, thank you for that reminder in there. I think we're all good. Join us all back. Don't forget to check the list. Coming through, sir. Coming through.